Welcome to the latest episode of our podcast series for financial advisors. Today's episode is how the investment playing field has been leveled for even the most sophisticated advisors and their clients. It's a conversation with Lawrence Calcano, chairman and CEO of iCapital Network. I'm Mindy Diamond, and this is Mindy Diamond on Independence. This podcast is available on our website, diamond-consultants.com and on advisorhub.com, as well as Apple Podcasts and other major podcast platforms. If you're not already a subscriber and want to be notified of new show releases, please subscribe right on your favorite podcast platform or on the episode page on our website. And if you find the content in this series to be useful and know others who could benefit from it, please feel free to share it widely. There was a time not long ago when advisors at the big brokerage firms had the edge when it came to accessing the most robust inventory of alternative investments, such as private equity and hedge fund options for their wealthiest clients. Access to alts, as they've come to be known, were once largely out of reach for those in the independent space, primarily because the strategy, negotiations, tax reporting, and ensuing paperwork was just far too complicated and best left to those at the big banks. But gaps in service offerings like these are opportunities for smart firms, a growing part of the industry where new platforms emerge regularly to fill holes as they appear. And that's exactly what my guest on today's show did. In 2013, Lawrence Calcano helped to launch iCapital Network, a platform designed to close the gap for advisors who previously couldn't go independent without losing some, if not all, of their private fund access. As one of few providers in the space, a space which became even smaller with iCapital's purchase of Artivest in May of 2020, the platform has helped level the playing field between the wirehouses and independents. RIAs no longer need to be at a big bank or have deep pockets to manage research, buying, and advisory services when it comes to alts, as iCapital's platform allows them to do so through cutting-edge technology, opening up greater potential to serve more clients better. iCapital itself is growing by leaps and bounds as of late. Having started 2019 with $8 billion in client assets and growing to a reported $55 billion in client assets as reported in May of 2020. Plus, the firm recently completed a $146 million round of funding with some of the biggest names in the business and acquired the feeder fund business from Morgan Stanley and Wells Fargo. So where is all this leading? What's the relevance of iCapital for advisors in both the independent space and traditional brokerage world? What's next for the alt space and iCapital? Let's hear what Lawrence has to say. Lawrence, thank you so much for making the time for me today. Uh, It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Mindy. You bet. I'd love it if you'd start out just telling me about your background. Sure. I spent 17 years at Goldman Sachs. I was a partner running our global technology group and really had a chance in that capacity to work with a lot of great startup companies, see a lot of new technology developed. Also, you know, work obviously on M&A transactions, IPO transactions, and make a fair bit of uh, investments for the various Goldman Sachs investment pockets. So it was a a really exciting and well-rounded experience, I'd say. So, okay, you are the chairman and CEO of iCapital Network. Tell us about that. Sure. So iCapital is really an end-to-end alternative investment platform, really focused on making it easy for advisors to offer their clients access to institutional quality alternative investments in a fully automated way. As a result, the experience for both the advisor and client is easy, it's efficient, 
and it allows the advisor the ability to offer these investments without the significant operational burdens typical of these investments. And I'd say historically, this asset class has really been the purview of institutions, both because of the lack of access as well as all the operational challenges. And so we're trying to break down all those barriers to make this asset class really relevant and important for advisors and their clients. So most of this enormous ecosystem that has been built to support the advisor leaving the traditional employee model to go independent, most of them, the genesis was in the leader having a vision and trying to fill a gap that existed in the landscape. So what was the gap that you were trying to solve in creating iCapital? You know, it's funny, gap's the right word because, you know, as I mentioned, it was really hard for advisors to get access to these assets on behalf of their clients. And so, you know, we watched a lot of these advisors leave their wirehouse platforms and and in so doing, they left behind the alternative platform that they had at the wirehouse. So we were trying to recreate that, which really involves solving the need end to end for advisors. So the first piece of that is access. So get access to the best funds. And one of the important things about alternatives is there's a huge interquartile spread between managers. And that means that if you're not in the best managers, you're going to have a very different experience from a performance standpoint. You really need to be in the best managers to be able to have a successful outcome here. So the first piece was access. And related to access, it was important that we provided access in the right size amounts for individual clients. The institutions that invest in these asset classes have minimums of 5 to $25 million, And that doesn't make sense for the vast majority of individual portfolios. So providing that access, you know, at $25,000 to $100,000 minimums made it really accessible for individual portfolios. In addition, you know, diligence and education is really critical. There's a wide variety of experiences that advisors have with these assets. And so making sure that we educate both on the asset class as well as the individual funds is incredibly important. And then lastly, I'd say just really making the operational burden of these investments much easier through technology. And so everything from how advisors see funds on behalf of their clients to how they invest in funds, through the capital call management, distribution management, the whole sort of life cycle end-to-end we've automated to make this uh, asset class really accessible and easy for an advisor to offer to their clients. And the target audience, at least upon inception or founding of iCapital, was the RIA? That's correct. And they were the folks that, you know, in leaving the wirehouse, as I mentioned, they were leaving behind access to all the managers that the wirehouse provided and and all the other support that I just articulated. And so it was very much focused on the independent wealth community. And when was it founded, iCapital? 2013. 2013. So, you know, it's, it's interesting because say 10 years ago in the independent space, if an advisor was looking to leave Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley, UBS, and go independent, one, he was an outlier. And one of the reasons he was an outlier was because the ecosystem to support the breakaway advisor was just not as robust as it is today. And that advisor would have had a on a piecemeal basis, pull together what he needed. And a lot of times when he got through the due diligence process, realized that the access just was going to be lacking. And I think you're right that when it came to access to private investments or really sophisticated alternatives, it was hard to replicate what they were leaving behind at the wirehouses. So today though, iCapital serves not just the RIA space, but the traditional brokerage space as well. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah. And can you tell us about that? Sure. So, you know, it's interesting as I was articulating kind of the the gap we were seeking to fill, we had assumed that because of the volume that was already being done on the wirehouse platforms, that they had what they needed. And it wasn't until really 2015 when we were spending time with Credit Suisse and they were talking about building out a private equity platform, they had had a hedge fund platform, but they didn't want to rebuild the PE platform. They wanted to outsource it. And through that process, we realized that 
a lot of the banks actually had not fully invested in the technology to drive this part of the business. They had a very manual approach in terms of, you know, adding people to scale and grow the business. So we saw an opportunity to bring technology to help the wirehouses really scale the business. And that obviously like anything important in life worth having takes a lot of time. And so, you know, it took us, you know, several years to call on the banks and really describe a value proposition. And I'd say that the the banks very much want to grow their alternatives business. If you you look at their CIO allocation, you know, their recommendations, it's 15 to 20% in alts. And so they very much want to grow this business. And so we were able to offer them the combination of a technology and operational platform that allowed them to really scale that business. And, and so today we're, you know, we're pleased to count, you know, among our clients, the, you know, the largest banks in this space, the UBS, Bank of America, Morgan Stanley, Raymond James, et cetera, and mo- most recently Wells Fargo. And so we're very excited to serve all of them. And, and really at the end of the day, our mission is to serve advisors. We are a B2B company and we're looking to make this asset class easier for advisors, irrespective of you know how they choose to operate or where they work. So we take a fairly uh, neutral view on advisors in terms of you know what model is best for them. That that's for them to decide how they want to run their business. We want to support them whether they operate at a wirehouse or whether they operate in the independent sphere. So to be clear, if you were sitting at a big bank, a wirehouse, so, so let's say you were at UBS ten years ago, you might have had access to the alternatives on your platform, but the operational burden, it wasn't, to quote you, it wasn't simple to get access to them. And iCapital came along and scaled the access and brought technology to bear. So it made it easier to access what they already had access to. Is that right? That would really describe the the independence. At the banks, the banks had access to, to product. And they had a, a fairly manual or you know, human intensive operation to support all those activities, supporting the sub, sub docs, supporting the, you know, if, if you've ever seen these investments, you know, 60 plus percent of the sub docs, so that's the, the subscription document you use to subscribe to an investment. Those documents come back incorrectly, filled out. And so there's a whole manual process of getting all that information right. And so while they had access and they continue to have outstanding access, adding technology helped them improve all their throughput and the various processes from, you know, the sort of early part of the process, which is around the subscription and the transaction processing through the end in terms of the reporting, you know, each quarter over many, many years. And so we're helping them to automate that. But I would say the the banks, particularly the large wirehouses, you know, do enjoy outstanding access to managers. And, and I capital for them, we haven't really changed that per se. But for the independents, We've offered the same technology and operational scale, but we've also offered access to managers to them, which in many cases they didn't have. And by the way, some of the RIAs we work with are quite large and they, like the wirehouses, have excellent access to managers. And so for them, our value proposition is fairly similar to the value proposition offered at the wirehouses around providing technology and an operational infrastructure to allow them to scale their business. Yeah. I think that, you know, the biggest thing is we talk all the time about how the last decade has really leveled the playing field where, just as you said, it doesn't really matter where an advisor chooses to practice or how he practices as an RIA or as an employee of the biggest brokerage firm, but it's much more about having access And the infrastructure and the tools from a technology perspective, no matter where he sits, to really best able to serve clients without sacrificing anything. And it sounds like iCapital on the alt side has really been a huge part of that. Yeah, look, I think that's a great characterization. You know, we've really tried to make it easy for people to operate in, as I said, whatever model makes the most sense for them. And a lot of the breakaways, it's interesting, you know, over time, I think a lot of the advisors that were you know, going independent, you know, they were largely focused on who their custodian was going to be and, and how they were going to report. And I think now 
as they break away, there's very big focus on making sure they can provide an alternative solution for their clients. And, you know, as I said at the very start, clients are quite interested in this asset class. It's a very important part of the client portfolios. And so advisors need to be able to provide this access. And so I think in a lot of cases, you know, we're being pulled in right around launch to be able to ensure that the advisor can offer a very, you know, full and, you know, excellent quality menu of investment alternatives so their clients know that they they have that uh, they have that access. Yeah, and so back to the major firms. You'd think that those mega institutions have the scale to build their own alt platform. And again, they already had the access, but to to build the technology in order to make the access more scalable and easy. Why did they necessarily need I capital. Sure. Look, the, the the banks do have a lot of scale and a lot of capital, and so you know that's definitely uh, that was a reality. And by the way, that drove our initial assumptions at the founding of the company. But really, if you think about it, like in any organization, there's you know there's a lot of tension for capital, there's a lot of tension for uh, or contention for investment in technology. And, you know, many of these businesses didn't have all the capital they needed allocated to building out, you know, a technology platform really targeted for alternatives. And so I think for a lot of them, they saw the ability to partner with iCapital as a mechanism to very significantly advance their their architecture. And, you know, technology is never done, right? You know, you build something and you launch it. The reality is you're constantly maintaining it. You're constantly adding functionality, security, et cetera. And so, you know, technology is a living, breathing thing. And the investment to keep the technology up to date is very significant. So I think a lot of the banks decided that, and they really made two decisions. One, they didn't want to be in the business of building it and they wanted to outsource it. And two, they really wanted to rely on a third party scaled infrastructure, just like they rely on the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ for trading. They wanted there to be a provider of an alt infrastructure that they could all rely on. And I think that's been, you know, a very exciting driver of, you know, as we've grown, you know, a lot of the banks are excited to see an independent company come along to service um, the needs of the whole marketplace. That includes all the banks. It also includes the independents. Um, and so I think the, the, the notion of there being a, a very reliable third-party solution is very appealing. And, and I would also add that there's a very important part of this discussion we haven't touched on yet, and that's the GP side of the equation, right? The GPs are similarly very focused on making sure there's an infrastructure they can rely on because the GPs themselves are not focused on or don't want to really build out this infrastructure infrastructure to take small tickets. Most of the GPs have built their infrastructure internally to be able to deal with a $500 million ticket coming from CalPERS, like one big check from one large investor. When you court the high net worth space, it's completely flipped, right? You, you have a sum of money that now, instead of coming in $500 million lot sizes, comes in $100,000 lot sizes. So now you have thousands of investors to process, and for that, definitely need technology. And so this is a whole ecosystem where I think we're helping to solve a problem both for the wirehouses and the RAAs, but also at the same time for the general partners that are looking to market into this wealth space. Yeah, for sure. And this concept of leveling the playing field or the democratization of the space, allowing an advisor, no matter where he or she practices, to really not sacrificing anything in terms of access is, to me, probably the most profound change in the industry in the last decade. But I want to be clear. So if an advisor were practicing at a wirehouse, pick one, Bank of America, Morgan Stanley, UBS, and now Wells Fargo, and they chose to leave to go independent, and they chose to use iCapital as an independent, Are they accessing the exact same platform? Is there a difference in terms of how they access it? Yeah, there is a difference. Um, Every one of the major banks that you just mentioned, you know, they manage the investments they select and diligence the, the, the managers that they offer to their clients. And so 
each bank will have access to different managers. Now, look, there's there's certainly overlap that the largest managers, you know, in the alternative space certainly market across the platforms, but there are certainly differences between what's available to the advisors. So when an advisor leaves those wirehouse platforms, they're not going to have access to exactly that same menu. Now, there's also overlap between the menu that we independently offer as well as, you know, from the wirehouse platforms as well. So we are providing, as I said earlier, you know, access to really outstanding managers, but it's likely not going to be exactly the same menu that's available, you know, on their wirehouse platforms. That actually brings me to my next question. You know, we we talk a lot about how advisors in captive models, so employee-based advisors of any one of those firms, lack access to the whole of market, W-H-O-L-E. Can you comment on the depth of the alt offerings at captive firms or big brokerage firms versus the RIA space? And essentially what we're talking about is the real definition of open architecture. Yeah, look, I, I would say pre-I capital, there was probably a pretty big difference. The wires have access. Look, just think about the volume that the wires do. And if you're a GP looking to raise capital from independence, you know, if you go to a wirehouse, the the amount of capital that you could possibly raise is just far more significant than in the independent channel. Again, I'm speaking pre-I capital. And so the wirehouse advisors really drove a lot of the volume. I would say more recently in the last, you know, five to seven years, a couple of things have happened. Again, I'll put iCapital aside for a second. One, a lot of the GPs are looking at this wealth market and saying, you know, we would like to have access to this capital. You know, there aren't, you know, any new pension funds being formed these days. And so if you want to grow your business, you, you really need to access this channel. And so a lot more managers, not just the largest, a lot more managers are looking to access this channel. And I think that, you know, inures to the benefit of all the players, both the wirehouse advisors as well as the independents. And then I think, you know, enter iCapital into the equation to be able to provide that access where an advisor doesn't have to worry about building out all the operational infrastructure, the technology, et cetera, we can deliver all of those solutions to the independent to allow them to have great access and an outsourced ecosystem to be able to you know, really manage the business. So I, I would say it's the, the industry has really evolved over time. I do believe the wirehouses continue to do an excellent job vetting, sourcing managers, you know, providing access. But I think the the RIAs, you know, now have a similar access. And, you know, as I said earlier, the largest RIAs have really enjoyed good access as well because, you know, they're able to speak for a significant amount of capital. So they have had a lead over other RIAs in terms of historically what they've been able to provide. In the end, as I said, we're trying to serve all advisors, no matter where they sit with, you know, outstanding technology, outstanding operational support. And I think really provide a service to the whole industry in a way that really makes us neutral to how people work, et cetera, and just provide the, you know, the same set of uh, capabilities that they all need to operate in the alts world. Yeah, which is ultimately such an amazing thing for the industry overall, for the end client and the advisors themselves. Because in the past, so say before iCapital or generally speaking, before this ecosystem really expanded itself to support the breakaway advisor, an advisor who chose to practice as an independent, who wanted to be an entrepreneur, was likely going to sacrifice something, either the access to the whole of market, the access to the most sophisticated products and solutions, or sacrifice the freedom. It was a binary choice. And today it's not binary. It's And that's a wonderful thing because an advisor is more likely to find his version of utopia and a client is going to be better served by an advisor who's happy how he practices. Yeah, I agree. Look, I, I think it's interesting. I, I'll go out on a limb a little bit here. Um, people who run all these businesses are smart. The people who run these wirehouses are really smart. The people who run these RIAs are smart and entrepreneurial. And I think over time, you know, there's going to be an increasing blending of how this all works, right? I, I think for the last several years, you're sort of fish or fowl, right? You know, you're either on a wirehouse platform, or you're not. And I think 
the reality is, look, a lot of the breakaways, you know, left, you know, in the end for a small number of reasons, uh, important reasons. But I think the wirehouses, I, I believe, you know, and, and this is just one person's opinion, they'll figure out a way to accommodate a broader set of operating models. And I think there'll be some people that really want to operate independently. It's what they're wired to do. And maybe they'll break away and be independent. You know, I think that's certainly going to continue and the independence will continue to thrive. But I think the, the either you're either this or that, I just think over time it's going to blend and the wires will offer more choices about how they work with people. The independence will continue. I just think there'll be a blending of the marketplace, which is why for us, you know, we want to serve the whole industry and believe that the industry benefits both advisors and general partners by having a neutral and very scaled operating platform that they can rely on to process all of their alternative investing. Yeah. I want to go back now to access. So one of the most frequently heard sort of myth we hear from a perspective breakaway is, and a large part of our listeners are just that, advisors that sit as employees at any kind of traditional firm, whether it be a wirehouse or regional or anything in between. And if they service an ultra high net worth client base, they have a belief, many of them, at least until they get educated, that independence is good for someone who serves the mass affluent or even high net worth. But when you get to the hundred million or billion dollar client and that client needs access to the most sophisticated alternatives, that it is lacking, the access is lacking in the independent space. Can you talk about that myth? Yeah, look, I think that that has broken down over time as this whole industry has evolved. I think advisors that have clients that are of that size are almost by definition very sophisticated advisors, right? You cannot maintain a book, $100 million clients, unless you and your firm are very sophisticated in terms of what you're able to offer, how you think about the portfolio, how you think about investing, and all the related services that are being offered. And those clients are, by the way, very demanding, as they should be because they have a lot at stake. And so I think, as I said, the the world is blending. And I think if you are an advisor operating with those kinds of clients, and I have friends who run these independents who are among the most sophisticated people that I know, who do a fabulous job taking care of their clients and provide them access to the full menu of investments that, that they need to build the portfolios that are appropriate for their family situations. So I just think there's sophisticated across the board and and if you're you know a smart sophisticated advisor in today's day and age you're able to offer a solution whether you're at a wirehouse platform where there certainly are an abundance of resources but you can also I think do the same if you're independent as well yeah how about with respect to socially responsible investing that's a real big trend you know it's funny people have been talking about that for years and I think now it's really starting to get some traction and I think there's a lot of people who feel like they can generate social returns while also generating financial returns and I think you know as I think about some of the sophisticated investors that we've talked to they're looking for both right and they're gonna hold their managers accountable for performance against both right and I think you know as it's evolved Involved, the early forms of socially responsible investing, you know, were very focused on the social returns, and I think the financial returns were not as consistent. And I think as people have gotten real focused, some of the leading firms in the industry have have built socially responsible investing businesses, and they focus very much, obviously, on generating financial returns, but they're also focused on not only generating social returns but measuring them. And the sophisticated people that want to make these kinds of investments are demanding and will continue to demand that, you know, just like you tell me what your investment performance is, I want to know what the social performance is as well. And I think as those metrics are developed and as there's more science around measuring those results, I think that style of investing is going to continue to grow and be an important part of the alternative landscape, an important part of the entire investment landscape, whether it's an alternative investment or a public investment. 
Yeah. And we mentioned it a little earlier, but how about access to the private markets? What kind of access do you offer? And how about the access for an RIA versus someone at a wirehouse? Well, look, I, I think it's it's very significant. As I said, the wirehouses kind of choose to offer the products they offer, and we, we manage and run those investments. But I think the private markets, by comparison, are quite large today. I mean, if you think about the fact that the number of public companies have shrunk really dramatically, you know, we're down to 4,000 or so public companies. And by the way, if you want to buy growth, there's only a handful of growth companies and everybody invests in them. And so, you know, by comparison, there's over 100,000, way more than that, private companies. And so, you know, you, you, you really need to have access to private investments to be able to have, you know, a full investment portfolio, the opportunity to build out the most comprehensive portfolio. So we think it's really critical uh, for people to have that access. I would point out for a lot of people, though, we believe investing through funds might be a better way to access that private slate of companies. Investing directly in private companies, you know, isn't for the faint of heart, right? And you've got to really understand all the things that could happen over the course of that investment. And I'll give you an example. You know, and I've seen this where if you measure the endpoints, a company raised money at at start and it goes public or sells for a high price. What you might miss in the middle is the fact that the private prices went up but then the company hit an air pocket. Maybe it hit a pandemic. You know, maybe it had to take in a lot of new capital, which served to significantly dilute the early investors or prior investors. In some cases, wipe out prior investors. So the end point may be great, but if you invested on the wrong side of a tough event for the company, you know, it might cost you your investment. That's why, in many cases, you know, investing through funds who are very sophisticated who have deep pockets to be able to support their prior investments um, might be a safer way for a large number of investors to access this private market as compared to going directly into private companies. So let's talk about access to iCapital now. So if you go independent, I imagine that the we know that the custodians, so Schwab, Fidelity, Pershing, et cetera, all have their own alts platform. But is it cost prohibitive for an independent business owner to access iCapital? How does the pricing work? No, it's not cost prohibitive at all because we don't charge independents to, to put on the cap on the platform. And so we make the platform available to advisors uh, for no charge. And then they have access to the products on the platform to offer to their clients. And so we make it very easy for advisors to adopt the platform. You know, in some cases, there might be some sophisticated uh, integration. It'll depend on, you know, the size of the advisor and, the, and what their investment platform broadly looks like. But it's not cost prohibitive at all for advisors to put the platform up on their investment uh, platform and make it available to their clients. So how does iCapital make its money? We, we make money through the raising of funds on the platform, not paid by the funds, but for managing the funds. So our model, like a lot of the fiduciaries we serve, is one-sided. We don't get paid to raise capital by advisors, by general partners, and then charge you know the advisory clients. We set up the vehicles. So let's say Blackstone is raising $300 million in the independent channel. We'll set that up, and then we charge a fee to run that interim fund that invests solely in that Blackstone fund, and we charge to run and manage that fund. In some cases where a general partner like on the hedge fund side, for example, is is willing to pay a retrocession or pay a fee back or reduce the amount that they charge, we just pass that back to the advisor and their clients. So they get the benefit of that. So we're not getting paid on both sides of the transaction. We only collect fees for managing the funds that we operate. Yes. Yeah, so hence the democratization or leveling of the playing field. It's just incredibly obvious. So, you know, I'm thinking about it. Could you give us an example of no names, of course, and no identifying characteristics, but an example of a very sophisticated advisor, I don't care where he sits, whether he's an employee or an RIA, but a very sophisticated advisor that's serving a very sophisticated client, an ultra high net worth client, and what sort of 
alts he's using in his portfolio and how he accesses it through iCapital? Is that a fair question? Yeah, sure. So there are some, I'll give you two examples. The first will be an advisor who has historically had great access to clients, to general partners uh, and various funds. And what they'll do is they will conduct the due diligence, manage the fund, uh, manage that whole process, but then use the iCapital infrastructure to present the fund to her clients to have you know her clients subscribe to the funds and then have iCapital manage all the capital calls distributions and integrate the reporting for her clients into either their custodial package or their homegrown reporting package or a third party reporting package so her clients at the end of the day have will outsource and manage all the technology and all the operational infrastructure, and she will have focused on manager selection. She'll have focused on all the discussions and the explanation to her clients and helping them understand each quarter how that fund is doing, et cetera. And and that'll be an example of one type of relationship. A separate kind of relationship with that same a sophisticated advisor with sophisticated clients, perhaps they have found uh, an investment on the iCapital platform that they're very interested. In that case, we would tend to have led with our diligence because we do diligence on every manager that's on our platform. We write a pretty comprehensive institutionally styled report. And so that advisor will read that report, will go through that report, and then you know, in, in some cases also want to conduct their own own diligence on the manager, which will facilitate. Maybe we do the diligence together on behalf of of their clients, and then they would go and represent the fund to the clients, discuss the suitability, the appropriateness of the investment for that client portfolio. And then we will in turn manage all of what I just described a second ago. And so really the difference advisor to advisor is often around whether they're selecting the manager and doing the diligence or we are. And as I said, there's, there are also cases when we do it jointly, which we, we love doing. We love collaborating with our clients in that regard. Yeah. I think another one of the biggest obstacles that an advisor considering independence worries about is having to do the the diligence around managers and you know the whole notion of drinking from a fire hose that it's too yes. much. And yes. so how would you talk a prospective independent through the fear? The fear that the compliance and regulatory risks will be too great and specific to alternatives, the fear around drinking from the fire hose and being just overwhelmed by too much choice. Well, look, it's really critical that anybody looking to get in, involved with this asset class is going to go out and hire you know, very thoughtful counsel around all the regulatory and compliance activities. They'll have a chief compliance officer, et cetera. And so that's really critical. And I, you know, personally, I, I would rather see people not invest in this asset class than invest without doing the proper work up front around you know, regulation and compliance or education and understanding these assets. You need to understand what you're suggesting your client invest in it. By the way, the advisors we work with are all you know, incredibly thoughtful about trying to provide thoughtful access to their clients. And so I'm sure that they'll have a regulatory and compliance counsel at their ready. On the diligence side, you know, as I said, it's pretty open architecture will provide and and many, probably most of our RAs by number will rely on our diligence and all the work we do. And we'll have very extensive conversations with them about the funds that we think make sense. But we can talk about the fund. They need to then figure out within their client base, you know, for which clients would this fund be appropriate given the objectives of of each client portfolio. And so that's obviously a really essential part of, of this whole process, you know, suitability, appropriateness, et cetera, making sure that the advisor is thinking carefully through which clients, you know, should be investing in the these kinds of investments. We have other advisors, as I alluded to in my example, that really pride themselves on doing you know, the deep due diligence and all the funds. And this is part of the modular offering. We can turn the diligence sort of on and off based on whether they want to do it or they want us to do it. So we work with advisors all the time in that regard. One of the things I would say, though, for even for advisors that do a lot of the work themselves, you know, they tend to have a certain number of people, you know, in the diligence area. And these markets are growing. The 
number of private equity strategies has, has grown dramatically, as has the hedge fund strategies, and then the number of managers within each strategy. You know, it's a, a huge number of GPs out there. So for a lot of those RIAs, we can provide kind of a funnel, right? And we're constantly kind of updating target lists, you know, by strategy across the private capital markets. And we can help an advisor narrow down their search. If they're looking for a specific kind of exposure, we can help them narrow down the search and they may dig in and do kind of the last mile diligence on the manager. And we have a number of RA clients, we've done this several times, where we create product collaboratively for them where they'll have a desire to create an investment expression for their clients and we'll build a fund together. And it might have one manager, it might have four or five managers in it, and it solves a very specific need they have for their clients. And then we'll in turn go and offer that that fund to other RIAs that might have similar needs. And sometimes the RIAs collaborate around this. And so, you know, it, what's really fun about this is that, you know, I think most people, you know, everyone's competitive in this space, but, you know, a lot of people want to be collaborative, right? And, and they recognize that, you know, clients have a similar set of needs. And, and if they can create a, a product that is relevant for other RIAs as well, then that product gets larger and it, it works to the benefit, you know, of their clients in the end from an expense standpoint. So, just just engaging with with advisors, whether they're independent or at wirehouse platforms, you know, is an incredibly enjoyable and rewarding part of our business. And it's it's getting in the trenches with advisors and helping them think about this whole asset class that gets us real excited and, and seeing people be successful in this asset class is essential. I mean, I would there's obviously a lot of regulatory changes that are people are considering. You know, at the end of the day, our total focus is helping advisors be successful with their clients investing in alts. And, you know, that's why I said earlier, I don't want people to invest in these assets if they don't understand them, if they don't understand what the risks are for their clients, because that's going to lead to a bad outcome and a bad outcome helps nobody. It doesn't help the advisor, the client, the general partner, it helps nobody. And so everything we can do to help advisors and their clients get into these assets in a thoughtful and educated way is really what we're driving towards. And do you think that, you know, alts have traditionally been associated with ultra high net worth investors? Do you see alts becoming more democratized across other client groups? Yeah, it's it's really starting to happen now. I mean, the SEC just, they put out rules around allowing investors to have access to private equity through their uh, 401ks, which is, you know, which is obviously a big change. And they're also considering a change to the definition of who's an accredited investor to allow more people to have access to these assets. I mean, look, the reality is everybody has financial goals in life, you know, to save for retirement, to save for, you know, major life events. And, you know, these assets have really provided, you know, outstanding return opportunities for investors. And I think the SEC is focused on making sure that everybody can benefit. But here again, this whole idea of having educated people, you know, investing is really essential. And this next wave of, of clients who may come into, you know, this marketplace, I think we'll probably start with with less experience almost by definition. And so it's really up to the industry to make sure people are investing thoughtfully um, so that they have successful outcomes. But it's it's happening. The SEC is is expanding the pie of people who can have access to these investments. Mm, yeah. I have to ask a pandemic related question because <laughs> can't okay. go. It's been we've been talking about 40 minutes and haven't brought it up once. So we're recording this in what I think is month four. You sort of lose track of the COVID-19 crisis. Um, right. So what impact has this global economic and health crisis had on your business? Well, there are a couple of dimensions to that question. You know, there's the investment dimension, and then there's the sort of technology dimension. And they're a little different. In March, when the markets got hammered, I think people looked at their portfolios and said, I, my, my portfolio is completely correlated. <laughs> and so I think a lot of advisors kind of are, are looking at portfolios and, you know, this is where hedge funds should provide great value in a portfolio, creating that lack of correlation. And so, you know, I think people are looking really hard at adding hedge funds and you can see the performance of some of these hedge funds in this period it has been 
has been quite strong, strong on a relative basis. So I think people are, are really looking at creating this market's been running up for so long, people just drifted into more long only, long only, long only. I think having hedge funds in the portfolio creates balance. I also think, you know, people are looking at private equity as a mechanism for long term capital appreciation and whether that's growth investing and in one of the sort of odd benefits of private equity is there it's not liquid. That's one of the things that have has scared people in the past, but I think that it not being liquid means there's not that panic hitting the sell button either, right? You know, you've got a, a manager that can manage that liquidity. Maybe they they find an opportunity to, to invest even further at depressed values. So we're seeing interest in private equity as well and growth. And then importantly, given the economic uncertainty, we're seeing a lot of interest in distressed as well. So those are a few comments on the investment side. The technology side, I think, is quite interesting, and I think it's something that goes far beyond iCapital's business. I think as we all work remotely, people are looking at their infrastructure and asking themselves the question, okay, am I able to operate at full capacity in a remote context, and in many cases, in a 100% remote context. And we've, for years, talked about our platform as creating efficiency and ease of use and, and making this easy for advisors. The, the, it's also true, I think, that automating the alternative part of your portfolio makes it easy to operate remotely. And so what we're seeing is a lot of people are kind of rethinking about our infrastructure, not just about how it makes their alternative business easier to operate, but as part of their business continuity program. So the technology piece of it is quite important. And I think that's broadly going to be true beyond the iCapital technology platform. People are going to really look hard at their infrastructure and be sure that they're investing in an ability to operate in any way. I mean, you know, it's unclear how people are going to respond once there's a vaccine and, and people feel generally safer. Are people going to start commuting again? Is everybody going to regather in their office in New York or Boston or San Francisco or Los Angeles? Or are people going to continue to work in some capacity remotely? I expect our business, you know, that people will continue to operate in a more fragmented way. Like we'll have some people who operate, no one will be 100% remote, but some people will operate remotely. We're going to take office space in more areas. So we have a little more diversification from a footprint standpoint. So having that sort of new working arrangement requires people to rethink about their infrastructure and how it will function in the new world. So, you know, I think ultimately, you know, that will end up being, you know, a good thing for our business given the importance of technology. So one last question. This has been incredibly fascinating. In June of this year, you announced that you were acquiring Wells Fargo's feeder fund business. And it was similar to an announcement you made prior about acquiring Morgan Stanley's too. And yeah. uh, you know, you're on the B of A platform and Raymond James and UBS and the like. So what's next for iCapital? Well, look, I mentioned this earlier, our, our, our focus is helping clients have success in this asset class. And so, you know, we think there's, you know, a lot of opportunity for us to continue to add more functionality and service for our existing clients. We see a lot of, you know, new opportunities in some cases related to what I just talked about from a technology standpoint, but importantly also is international growth. We're managing today about $58 billion across 750 or so funds. And of that, maybe 12 plus billion of it is, is already coming from non U.S. investors. And so we have a number of, you know, investors in iCapital that are based uh, outside the U.S. who can help us really scale. And so we're, we're looking to really continue to drive into the global market and help create solutions for advisors, you know, throughout Europe and Asia as well. And, and we see that as a very big opportunity. And we'll probably have more to say about that late summer, early fall. But we think the international area is a really important growth area for us. And just generally, everything we can think of to make this asset class easier for people, we've, we've talked about adding institutional style liquidity through our NASDAQ partnership, providing broader access you know, within alternatives to apply not just to qualified purchasers, but to accredited investors as well. That's a, an important extension of our offering that we're in the middle of right now. And then you know, incremental direct opportunities, direct companies, direct 
pieces of real estate, et cetera, really broadening the number of products. You know, in the end, we want iCapital to be the industry's alternative platform. So all of the various security functional features that continue to push the the envelope forward is, you know, is where we're focused. Yeah. Well, you have clearly built something extraordinary. You have clearly built something that is sustainable and very needed. It was built seven years ago to fill a gap, but it sounds like there is no limit to what you're going to do. And we look forward to having you on again and hearing more about what you're doing. Mindy, you're you're awfully kind to have us on. We appreciate it. And thanks to you. And and by the way, thanks to all the people at iCapital who've who've really made this happen. There's, you know, close to three hundred people that are working their butts off to serve our clients. And so they get a big thank you as well. You bet. Thanks again, Lawrence. Really appreciate your time. Take care. My conversation with Lawrence Calcano makes it clear just how much the ecosystem supporting the breakaway market has expanded and that access and ease of use has been democratized. This means that an advisor at Merrill or Morgan is no better or worse off than an advisor who is practicing as a standalone RIA. And that is good for the industry, clients, and advisors alike. I thank you for listening. And I encourage you to visit our website, diamond-consultants.com, and click on the tools and resources link for valuable content. You'll also find a link to subscribe for regular updates to the series. And if you're not a recipient of our weekly email, Perspectives for Advisors, click on the blog link to browse recent articles. These written pieces are an ideal way to stay informed about what's going on in the wealth management space without expending the energy that full-on exploration might require. Feel free to email or call me if you have specific questions. I can be reached at 908-879-1002 or by cell, especially these days, at 973 476 8578 or email mdiamond at diamond-consultants.com. Please note that all requests are handled with complete discretion and confidentiality. And again, if you enjoyed this episode, feel free to share it with a colleague who might benefit from its content. And a special thanks to advisorhub.com for sharing this podcast with their viewers and subscribers. This is Mindy Diamond on Independence.